Um, I would like to uh, introduce Professor Jonathan Wilson, who's with us today. Um, Professor Wilson is an award-winning academic and consultant who specialises in what he calls the ABCDs of business and culture, advertising, branding, communication, and digital. He has published over 200 pieces of work, which have, which have led to over 100 conference speaking engagements across the globe. He's worked with the Indonesian Ministry of Tourism, Al Jazeera, and Virotech fashion brand ISHU, amongst others. And his work on halal branding is some of the most widely cited globally. His research on luxury branding and inconspicuous consumption featured in Harvard Business Review and won Best Paper Award in the Journal of Marketing and Management. In 2017, Professor Wilson received a LinkedIn Top Voices Award and was one of the featured professionals in their cross-platform advertising campaigns, something that he's especially proud of and he, um, as he was the only UK academic. Can I please give you, Professor Wilson, uh, a warm UWS welcome. Thank you very much, Claire. So, um, when I die, could you read like uh, my eulogy? Out? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I always have an out-of-body experience when I hear someone like that go through my bio. Thank you very much uh, for still being here and not running out after after the first talk. Um, when I click, okay. So I'm going to leave that slide for a little bit. If you want to take down my details, then then please do. Um, you might also notice the picture of me on the slide. Now. The, the running joke with my students is I leave that slide for a little bit of time. I, I kind of have a very similar slide for all of my talks. Um, and that kind of starts off my conversation. The purpose of today is for me to try and encourage you to want to communicate more and to do so online and possibly with strangers and people that you've never met before. Right? Um, so I actually think that, you know, um, I found myself going mm, to a lot of things that you mentioned and I agree and also thinking, yeah, but and maybe later on today we'll be able to debate those things. One of the things that I like about PowerPoint, and I think why I will continue to use PowerPoint, is coming from an advertising background, it's a billboard. So when I design my PowerPoint slides, I design them to be like billboard adverts. And billboard adverts are very good at grabbing attention if you design them properly. What billboard adverts are not very good at is guiding you to do something directly from the commands on those billboards. So I actually learned that if you have a slide up, then advertising people naturally assume that people will take notice and then they will act. It doesn't necessarily happen. If I say, for example, here is my slide with my details, contact me, I increase the response rate. Even more if I say, get out your phones now, and take a picture or get out your phones and put in my details into your phone and tweet me now or find me on LinkedIn or connect or something and massively increase the response rate. Maybe I should do it. So get out your phones and do it. Right. Uh, you have full permission to take pictures, whatever you want to say. Uh, I don't mind. So my first piece of advice is don't miss the opportunity to communicate with people. Make your slides contactable then. So, if we kick things off, let me go into things from a slightly different perspective with regards kind of our, all of our futures. It doesn't matter whether you're a student, a graduate, or a member of staff or faculty. Uh, they predict that we're going to have lots of different jobs. Now, why would that be the case? Because, as you pointed out, right, the robots are coming. Right? I've had a lot more conference invites asking me to talk about humans versus robots and Blade Runner and all of these other sci-fi programs. Does anyone remember Logan's Run? Okay, well, there you go, right? So we could have Sandman coming for us at some stage. But I don't think things are as drastic as, as kind of the predictions make, or if you're watching breakfast television, it's always GMTV, is it? With Susanna Reid and Piers Morgan, I got annoyed by them this morning. Um, I don't think it's going to be like that. But what we will face is perhaps a different job title and a different role. So if someone asks me, am I going to be a university professor in 10 years' time? I have no idea. I honestly don't know what I could be doing. But I think that at the centre of what I'll be doing will be communication, right? So communication for me is a very important skill. Um, and that's been a running thread. So prior to being an academic, I worked in advertising. I uh, was a musician as well. Um, and there's always been this idea of kind of communicating. But for the younger generation, this idea of different career paths 
The idea, I mean, does anyone have more than one job? Does anyone have what they call what, a side hustle now? Right, like a side hustle when you work in the gig economy. This idea that now is perfectly acceptable to have this job and then to sell things online or to have maybe a steak in a restaurant. All of these things are seemingly unconnected, but it's you that connects them together, right? So, this seems to be the approach that's coming, especially West. If you lived in Asia, then you might argue that it's always been like that and people are, are becoming more kind of Eastern in their, in their thinking. Now, the other thing that they say in this part of the world is a lot of us are going to be freelancers. That might be good news or bad news. Who knows, hey? The gig economy. So, if that's the case, does anyone work as a freelancer? How do you find it? Do you like it? It's good when the sun's out and you can work from home, right? And you don't have a desk because you hot desk so that you don't have to go into work. And you can work at any time of the day on a beach or anywhere. It's bad if you don't have any clients, right? It's bad if you don't have your next piece of work. It's great if you're being paid X amount of pounds per hour, much more than everyone else. It's bad if you want to go on holiday and you haven't worked out how to save money or, or how to cope with those periods. But one of the things that I kind of, because I've worked full time, freelance and part time, is managing those expectations of how you can exist in an environment where perhaps your job is not for life. You know, if I spoke to my father before he retired, um, I think there were probably like 20 years that he didn't have a CV because he worked for the National Health Service and he worked in the same hospital. Um, they didn't need CVs. Like, you know, you found a hospital, you worked there, and then that was it. This idea that you're constantly updating your CV. And as a guide, I uh, definitely review and update my CV every two months. My CV is on ice. If you said send me your CV, I can send you now. Um, because I think that, as you rightly pointed out, time is of the essence, right? If somebody has to wait for that CV, for that opportunity, then it disappears. Even worse a journalist, actually. If a journalist contacts you, they expect you to be able to give them a response within the next few hours. If you can't, then they'll pick somebody else, right? So we're working in a scenario where people want things quickly and there's uncertainty because perhaps you could be working for somebody else, right? Now, the other thing that I like to put up, and some of you might not be from a business school, is this idea of the business school butler. I did my MBA in the 90s, and in the 90s, I left university with shorter hair, like, you know, shorter beard, uh, a ma matching jacket and trousers, grey. And um, upon reflection, I thought, was I a business school butler? By that, what I meant was impeccable business skills and manners designed to perfectly fit within an organisation. But if you think about the analogy of being a butler, who wants to be a butler at a party? Right? Surely you want to stand out. Surely you want to be having permission to speak and to enjoy yourself, right? So it made me reflect upon when I, when I became an academic. Is that really what I want from my students? Do I want to give them impeccable skills and manners that allows them to fit in within an organization? Yes, but also not take away those dreams that they came to me with in the first place, right? They didn't come here to want to fit in. They wanted to do something different. <coughs> and you mentioned disrupt. So how do we get that balance? Now, I know that the, the suggestion was dare to be different. I think my school motto was Sapura Hour there, or so it's in Latin, I mean, who still learns Latin now? But it meant dare to be wise. So I think being smart about daring to do something is really important. So if you don't want to be the business school butler, and also, perhaps by extension, the business school butler or the business school model that fits is the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, does business school education work for women? Um, if you look on LinkedIn, it seems some of my articles I've, I've was asked to write on International Women's Day, so I would reflect upon the challenges that women face in the workplace, the dynamics, things like um, if you haven't heard of the one inch rule, then it's kind of explained in the article. But there are lots of things and lots of different challenges that people face. So, if it's not the business school butler approach, uh, what are we seeing? Yeah, mobile phones are really important, right? You can run a business through a mobile phone. You can take on the world with a mobile phone. Donald Trump's kind of showing us how to do that, right? But here are some interesting stats for me, being a marketer or, or interested in consumer behavior. How many people go online through a mobile device only? I now have students that don't have computers. They don't back up their information, sadly, right? They don't know what the cloud is. There are lots of people that have access to that device 
And especially when mobile phones are being recycled into other parts of the world, like in Indonesia, more people have mobile phone plans than bank accounts. You look at Africa, people have access, uh, even with the Nokias that don't have color screens, it still access to the internet. But people are going exclusively through mobile devices, and that's increasing. So how we communicate, whether that's a virtual learning platform, whether that's a website, all of these things kind of matter when the screen is quite small and your logo is going to be the size of your little uh, finger nail, right? Um, being concise is really important, right? And I think that we haven't, as uh, practitioners, thought about how online works if people are just going through a mobile device. So if that's the case, and even if we look down at some of the other stats, what else do we, do we see? For me, that's the real behavioral change. It's not Facebook or Moodle or LinkedIn or any of these things. It's what is the behavioral change which I think will not uh, swing back again, right? This idea that now people answer phone calls whilst answering the call of nature is really fascinating to me. Um, you go to a shopping center and you see people going into cubicles to, what, update their Instagram profile, to take pictures in the mirror of the toilet, to, to receive phone calls in private, uh, at work people may be doing exactly the same thing. Whereas before, like if you, if you cast your mind back, someone going to the toilet with a book seemed a bit strange, or a notepad, um, you know. But now if you think, some people are actually dealing with crappy emails like in the toilet, right? Like, you know, think about it for one minute. If you're communicating with people, are you the message that someone likes to respond to when they're on the train, smiling? Or are you the message that someone is pruning their inbox when they're in the toilet? I actually think about those things. Um, so, it doesn't matter to me what website you're on, what app you're, you're developing, or whatever it is. It's the fact that people are saying goodnight to this pet and saying good morning to this pet that they stroke and they pinch and they tweet. And all of this information is within that device. So, the challenge for me is how do I get into that device? How do I find a way to communicate with people? Because emails die. It will still exist, but the function which it fulfills, if we think like 20, 30 years ago, think about, about written letters, uh, they don't mean the same. Well, some students will tell me, you know, some Generation Z, if you believe in those classifiers, will say that um, they love receiving handwritten letters with a real fountain head. It has a special role in their life. It means that you really like them. You took the effort to do that, right? But the reality is that we don't really, I mean, how many of you leave letters on your doormat? It comes through the door and you don't open it for a few days. Be honest. Or, or you look at the letter and it's like, oh, you said Mr. or not Professor. Okay, then you don't know me. Or you spelled my name wrong. Or it says, like, you look on the back, it was delivered. It's from Glasgow. Oh, right, your student loans company. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking, looking at you. Um, for a few days. Uh, the reality is that we, that we now treat things coming through our letterbox in a different way than we used to, right? So why wouldn't that change when it comes to our emails? How many emails do you get a day? 100? Or more than 100? That's really hard, right? That's really hard. So what's replacing it? Who uses WhatsApp? Do you use it a lot? Do you use it with colleagues? Uh, you see, the UK is still, you know, we, we, we might do. I mean, do any of you use it like a walkie-talkie where you... You can't be bothered to dial somebody because you know they won't pick up the phone because it's on silent and if they see your number, they're on the toilet anyway or something. And, 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 so, and so I find that you know, this thing that it was predicted was at a tech conference a few years ago and they said, oh, people have phones and they won't use them to make phone calls. We all thought it was absurd about 10 years ago, but it's kind of happening, right? You've got this device and you might try to call somebody and they probably won't answer. So now you leave an audio WhatsApp. Hi, I just wanted to tell you X, Y, and Z. And they can't interrupt you, so you can talk to them 30 <laughs> seconds, and then you can get on to the next task that you have to do. So you go, reply, and then the other person replies. Um, one of the things that I've noticed is that actually, in, you know, if, we go, if we go further east, I was in Russia last month, um, they really use WhatsApp. They're blocked from LinkedIn, because LinkedIn won't house data in Russia. Uh, therefore, they have no presence um, because, of, because of Russian law, but they use WhatsApp. I have government ministers WhatsApping me audio messages. I did work with the Indonesian government, and they sent me my, con my contract PDF WhatsApp. I would email them back because I thought, is this really a job? Like, is this really, is this really real? Because I've got some WhatsApp, you know, 
profile picture of someone like kind of like this, <laughs> and like you know, sending me jokes every now and again. I was like, is this really work? Are you really going to pay me? Could you email it, please, on official paper? Which eventually happened, but all communication was through WhatsApp. Uh, important things like, oh, the minister has just said that we need to like do it. I was like, okay, fine. So I can see that in other parts of the world it makes sense because they have your profile picture, they know when you're online, they know when you've seen the message. And every now and again, when things get too serious, they can send you like an emoji or something like that. <laughs> Have you looked at the proposal? You know. <laughs> Very quick to read, especially if English is not your first language. Like if you are dealing with people from other countries, they don't really want to sit down and write an email that with, with spell checker maybe or may not be enabled. So they just want to be able to kind of just type something out very quickly and use emojis or audio. So these things are being replaced for all of the reasons that I said. Who plays that game of seeing when somebody has seen your message? <laughs> right, whether that's LinkedIn or WhatsApp or something like you do. It's funny that you actually, when you wanted to talk to them, you actually went... I found a way. But you went to LinkedIn, didn't you? You have my email address, but you actually went to LinkedIn. There you go. Was it to see if I saw your message? Yes. There you go. <laughs> so so the, the question is, could we move into this environment with colleagues, because it's not really happening yet in the UK, right? That you would feel, you wouldn't kind of feel that you needed to take a shower afterwards if you gave your colleagues your mobile phone number and spoke to them on these platforms, or your students. So, I don't give students my mobile number, but effectively, if they are talking to me on Twitter, or Instagram, or LinkedIn, they, they get into my phone. So, it doesn't, so actually, it doesn't really matter. They, they can message me. And that's actually the same as email, right? So one of the things that I, I've, I've debated with colleagues is when they say, should you or should you not connect with students on LinkedIn before they've graduated? And some of you have very strong views that this might be you know, not the right thing to do. But then my answer would be, but how is it any different to email, right? Or how is it any different to the fact that you have email and their details on the system? It's actually better than email because I have their face there, I know what they're sharing, and when they graduate, they update their profiles. So I'm always constantly in touch with them. So there are students from here, I mean, it's good now, students from 10 years ago that actually employ me, have offered me work and paid me. Now, if they had my email address from 10 years ago, then, then we wouldn't be able to talk to each other, right? So if we're moving to different databases, let's also look at the invisible handcuffs. What are the invisible handcuffs? These things that hold us back. Probably you're going to make excuses. Probably you will say, ah, oh, but you know, I'm not really a sociable person. I'm not really. I'm kind of joke. I'm, I'm kind of the most uh, sociable, antisocial person you can meet. Right? Most academics are not very sociable. We like to lock ourselves away and think about things. Um, and if you were to kind of forensically look through my profile. I'm really faking it. You, know, you don't see you don't see my entire life on social media. I've given you information about you know kind of my ethnic origin and my parents, and I could tell you my grand was from Dumfries, um, but you don't see pictures of my kids. You don't see lots of things online. Um, so you might make excuses. Or you might say I, I don't have any time. I don't have any time, or I'm a private person, or I don't know what to say, or I don't want to look stupid. Or I have nothing in my life. I'm not doing anything compared to this other person who spent thousands of pounds on handbags and is jetting around the world and they have perfect photograph opportunities, even though you've got Paisley High Street. I don't know what your, your problem is, right? <laughs> but, but, you, but you feel like, oh, but I don't have the filters. There are lots of reasons why you might say no. So what if I was to kind of rebut some of these and say, but I guess, look at it a different way. Wouldn't you like to be offered work without chasing it? Like if someone said, like if we go back to the freelance thing, if someone said, oh, I know who you are. How about you come and work for us? Wouldn't you like that opportunity? Or for academics who are then going to be hit with the stick of impact with your research and you have to disseminate. So normally it goes, you write the paper, you present it at the conference that you've then submitted it to and they've scrutinized over and then you go back to your research director and you pay for the privilege of presenting your work at the conference, right? And then maybe it becomes a journal paper, and then you blow up, you blow into the, the world of academia, and then hopefully it will promote itself, right? The journal is ranked to such a high degree that people really read your papers and they download them, right? Your students read your papers, right? 
<laughs> it doesn't kind of work like that. So I don't really agree with this farming cycle when actually there are alternative approaches. Like industry conferences might actually invite you and look after you rather than your university have to pay for you to go. Or if you're promoting your work, then government ministers, then journalists, then industry people would actually know what your paper is about and they could find you and you would get impact. I found very few people that wouldn't benefit from the opportunity to promote themselves in the right way, right pitch, pace, poise, tone, approach, and it would have a positive impact, right? So, one of the things that you'll see online is intersectionality, the idea that you can tackle race, religion, politics, ethnic issues, gender issues, all sorts of issues, and find your own voice. This has worked really well for me, and perhaps this is a barrier for some people. They say, but what if I go online and say something that's going to get me in trouble? Say sorry. And, oh, oh, but then you might argue, well, who's, who followed the, the song with Alan Sugar last week? Right. Are you going to watch The Apprentice again? You are. Even after you said that? Okay, why? Because it's just a bit fun, isn't it? Is it, though? Have you got any Senegalese friends? Have you got any Senegalese friends? Ah, see, this is the thing. This is, it's quite interesting when you go on social media and you look at the various debates and how people react and, and the strong views that they hold. But I still maintain that probably all of you in this room, you're not going to make those mistakes, are you? You don't want to be that famous, do you? You're not that desperate for people to love you and like you, are you? So you're probably not going to say those stupid things that people like Alan Sugar or Donald Trump or you know any of these other people say, right? You're not really wanting to be like Kim Kardashian, are you? <laughs> right. So I don't really see the, the worry. But I think that engaging is important. And perhaps a good way to engage is first to look and then just to ask questions. I don't get what the problem is. Could you explain it to me? It's quite an interesting response to give, and that shows that you're part of the community. So. Another way of looking at it is like this. When I would, uh, when I, I used to work in industry and manage people all to students, one piece of advice I'd give them is, well, yeah, okay, it's great to have a, um, a great degree or qualifications and great business cards, but ultimately, when I would, uh, when I was recruiting people, the main thing that would pop into my head would be, do I want to be around you 40 hours a week? If it's not going to be fun, if it's going to be hard and difficult, I probably don't want to work with you, right? That's the 40 hours a week question that I would think about, right? And so that meant that it wouldn't necessarily mean that the person who went to Oxbridge or the person with the first would get all the good jobs. There's that kind of underlying assumption. Not necessarily. So think about it like this in terms of social media. Would somebody want to hang out with you on social media or, or receive your posts, like, all the time? If they would, then you're onto a good thing. That probably means that you're not, unless you're, like, very, very special, you're not going to be saying the same thing every day all of the time, which a lot of companies try to, which is force one message down your throat and say, please come and visit our website and, well, why, you know? Do you care about what I've had for dinner or, you know, and I've experimented. If you were to go into the history of my LinkedIn profile, you see that I've posted things like bargain buckets of KFC and chicken and gravy, and I found out that actually that got me as many likes and views as a picture with an Instagram follower with five million followers, right? People like, KFC fried chicken and gravy as much as they did this model, right? I told her that and she was very impressed. <laughs> so, I think that these things are really important. Good company, intriguing and relevant. Now, in order to consolidate all of those things, whether you're an individual, whether you're a department or an academic or an institution or a company, for me it's about building a brand. So you build a brand which is supposed to allow you to put all of this information and contain it in a way that allows people to understand you quicker, more easily, um, more emotionally, you amplify what it is that you have to say, and you're consolidating, communicating, elevating. Those are the basic principles of branding, right? You could all do that. Now, some people say, oh, we're all brands if you think about it. I don't think everyone is, is a brand necessarily, but has the potential to be a brand, because brands are supposed to be able to allow you to charge a premium. So not everybody can walk into a room and say, oh, this is my name, and then people pay more money. Think, oh, okay, you're Paul, are you? <sighs> okay, I like, give Paul a little bit more money. Right? But you have the potential to be able to do that, or to hold your own. So if you're going to go down this route of a strategic branding approach, because you want to be able to measure that what you're doing actually is working, what could you do? Well, basic brand theory, you know, if any of you recognize, that's Pharrell. Do anyone, does anyone recognize those trainers? 
Adidas, Shell Toes, or Superstars that have been around since the 80s. Anyone wore Shell Toes in the 80s? Listen to Run DMC by Adidas. <laughs> right? So those trends have not changed. So sometimes people think that it's about innovation and that you have to be the newest thing. A pair of trainers that are just as uncomfortable as from the 80s, right? That are still selling for about the same price, but are just in different colours with a different endorser. But essentially, brand theory is telling you that if you were to make a pair of trainers which cost about eight pounds, you probably could only sell them for about 10 to 15 pounds with no labeling on them, with no logo, because people would be like, okay, don't know where you're from, who owns this, whatever. But if you put the right logo on it and the right name and country of origin and all those things, you can probably charge more, 100 pounds, if not more. Anyone have a pair of Yeezy trainers? Kanye West, if you did, you could charge several hundred pounds for your pair of trainers. So the same principle applies to a university, to a department, to an individual, to a graduate, all of those things. So even, is anyone currently studying now? Okay, it's like a half. So you can still, you should be brand building now so that you hit the ground running for when you graduate. Like, second year, doing that internship, showing people that you know about industry so that when you're like, I'm open for business now, congratulations, you'll be pleased to know that I'm ready to graduate and I'm looking for that right job. People go, oh right, you are great, here's the job. In theory, it should be as simple as that, if you communicate early. Because the best form of communication is about laying the groundwork early, right? Who likes the, the, the conversation, which is like, hey, I like your shoes, um, can I have some money, please? Or, you look really interesting, um, could you help me? Which essentially is marketing if you don't do so early enough, right? How many times do we use social media where we think, I'm just going to tell you what I'm up to, but not necessarily think about what people have been up to previously, or embedding yourself in the community. So if you get a brand, there are approximately three st stages of that. First, creating that brand. So that identity and that personality and all of those attributes. And I would be as wide ranging as possible. So when I thought about the information that I wanted to share with people, obviously I pick and mix. If it's a conference on science, I'm going to lead on the fact that I have a science degree. If it's a conference on diversity, then I'm going to talk about my family background. If it's a conference in Scotland, then maybe I'll talk about the fact that my grand's from Dumfries. But you have the style book, right? And my clan is gun, and she was Macmillan's, but I had the gun kill, right? If you go online, you'll see a picture of me wearing a gun, clan, kill. Um, so think about the pieces of information that you have that reinforce your identity and personality, and then share them. You don't get anywhere without sharing them. You have to share them and to collect the feedback. And if you can do that, then you're embedding yourself into a cultural system where hopefully, if you think about top brands, they start to influence culture, right? So brands shape culture, and culture shapes brands. Now, a bit of psychology, just a little kind of bit of pop psychology. Has anyone studied transactional analysis? Right, so I'm preaching to the converted. Transactional analysis encourages people to think about different styles of communication. So you could communicate in a parental way. You could be very nurturing, like, you know, I'll give you an example. I know you work very hard. I know it's hard for you, and I'm so proud of you. Or parental way. See, the problem with students is they never pay attention. They're always at the back, messing around with their phones. Or an adult way, which is very neutral communication. Or adapted child, the vice chancellor has told me that I have to encourage you to attend because we have a policy. Or free child, who cares about studying anyway? Let's be great, right? All of these skills should be mastered. I, I first came across this, uh, especially working in advertising, where we were taught to be able to use all styles of communication and so that we could select which one we would use in, in the right moment. So if you think about communication, and the online communication, there are lots of people that act like free child. Oh, this is boring. Well, I don't like this guy. He's not nice. And there are lots of parental people that are criticizing and saying, no, shame on Alan Sugar. He should step down. How could the BBC employ such a person hold such views against selling all these football players? This is disgraceful. Um, but adult communication often gets lost. Now, I'm not telling you to talk in a, not to talk in a neutral adult way, but what I am saying is that if you want to map the dynamics of communication, being able to talk in different tones really works, because that's how real people respond, right? How many friends do you have that only criticize, or only talk in a parental way? Even your parents, it, doesn't, it, it wears off after a while, right? <laughs> <laughs> or your friends. So we like balanced communication, so practicing those in different forms, face-to-face, 
spoken, thumbs, 140 characters, 240 characters, 2,000 words. I spend a lot of time kind of trying to find different ways to use words and to communicate in different tones. Because even for academics, I can write the, the journal paper, or perhaps you might say the boring journal paper, but people don't really want to read it, apart from 25 people in the world who are in that same journal community, right? Other people, journalists, want to know in 200 words. Uh, you might have 30 seconds on the news channel, or in front of a government minister, then you've got 15 seconds probably before they switch off, right? So you have to learn a way to be able to communicate your language in different lengths and, and all sorts of things. Now, I think that a lot of that is reinforced by the emotional facets of human beings, right? Your personality has to shine through. People talk about passion. But also, you've got to show, I guess, that you're book smart, street smart, you're certified, you're qualified. And there are different ways to do that. Um, there are very few people, I think, that, that can continuously reinforce their credentials by saying so themselves. How many of you know people say, well, when I was uh, at university and I was a professor and when I got my PhD, and other people, you know, some people might like that, but other people might be turned off by that, right? They might say, oh, here he goes with his PhD. Everything was about when he got his PhD. Did he think like that before he got his PhD? Um, so if you're not going to do all of that heavy lifting, then you need to have other people saying that. They can say that if you can give them the information. You need to arm them with information and encourage them in a nurturing <laughs> way to want to share that information. Some of the best brands do that. Apple, everyone talks about it, But a lot of people talk about Apple, and they don't actually have to mention the brand themselves. So if you can create such a culture where you are letting your personality shine through, you're giving people information that allows you to increase your credibility, that allows you to work with people in a more emotional way, then you're going to hit those pleasure centers. Some Philosophers talk about there being three pleasure centers in humans. Physical, intellectual, and spiritual. Animals can only experience physical pleasure. Humans mainly experience physical and intellectual pleasure, right? That's that, wow, isn't kombucha really good for you? <laughs> right? But you might have a spiritual moment on, on rare occasions. So if you think about things like that, I, rather than costs and benefits, I like to think about things as risk and pleasure, right? How can you maximize pleasure? How can you reduce risk? But you can't completely reduce risk, otherwise you know you might never experience certain aspects of pleasure. So, social media is the 80-20 rule for me, which is spend most of your time saying good things about other people. I kind of have a general rule, which is, with exception, I tend to find good things to say. But if things really annoy me, or someone really needs to be told off, then I'm not afraid to do that. But as a general rule, I want to find good news. I want to spread good news, and the majority of that has to be about other people. Now, sometimes that's challenging because for some academics, they might actually, you know, some it might be different in this university, but I've been in universities where there is a culture where it's like, if I sign, say nice things about your work, then you might get promoted and I won't. They'll think you're a better academic than me, right? I think that academics are actually quite bad at, at supporting each other when it comes to research. I don't see many. Uh, communities of academics where a colleague in your department says, I've just published a paper, and then publicly someone goes, wow, that's an amazing paper, I can't wait to read it. Does it happen here? It does? Okay, well this is the only place that I have to change that experience. But uh, consistently, like, you know, so you have colleagues say, once again, Professor so-and-so is delivering groundbreaking research. I'm so glad to be in the department with him. No. <laughs> But some people do do that in some industries, and it works very well for them. I just think that we kind of sometimes in this mindset where we're afraid that you know if we say good things about other people, then there won't be any good things for us, right? All the good jobs will go. Whether you're a member of staff or a graduate or something, or all the journalists will want to talk to you, right? Try and take a risk and say good things about other people, and then over time they might just start saying good things about you. The good news is that if you spend 80% of your time saying good things about other people, you can really showboat for 20% of the time, and nobody cares. Here's me with my Academy Awards <laughs> once again. You're like, oh, wow. <laughs> but if it's all that you say, then people get turned off really quickly. So having said all of that, I, this is a bit of a joke, um, but I think that a lot of social media kind of advice 
is pretty masculine, which basically means make audiences like everything. I came up with this acronym because it's about like, like look how big my following is, like look how many people like me, look at the size of my biceps, or you know, social media is filled full of these kind of stories of people wanting to have large audiences and basically brag using large amounts of data. And I don't think that it's really about that. If you look, actually, I think social media should be more feminine in approach. It's about this legacy, and that's the thing that I want to say. So if you want to get online, don't think of it as needing to have lots of followers and needing to have everybody like what you say. And, you know, no, think about like what you want to do. Think about the community of people that you would like to be involved in and you would like to nurture. So I never, you know, when I went on this journey of trying to understand social media more, and, you know, I'm not really on Facebook, to be honest, and a lot of young people aren't anymore, right? You, you pointed out Snapchat as being, as being something more uh, of importance to them. So along the journey, I did learn, though, that if you keep consistently doing something, then actually it's quite fun, and you do actually pick up different communities of people. So if we're going to go on this long-term grind, basically, of spending this, like, half an hour a day on LinkedIn or something like that, like, where, where could it lead? Well, here's a, uh, a friend of mine, another academic. He actually uh, used to work on Newsnight and Channel 4 News. So he's a journalist. He did a PhD in cinema journalism. But one of the things that I learned from him was the importance of video. Um, so I, I spent like a couple of hours hanging out with him and then thinking, actually, you know, going back to the whole smartphone thing, the thing that we spend a lot of time doing now is what we watch less television, but we still watch videos, right? YouTube, like, you know, 20 seconds, 60 seconds, whatever it is. All of you in this room can make films using your smartphones. So if you were to check some of the stuff, like the vlogs that I do, they're just with an iPhone. I have an external mic, just so kind of a flipping mic. Or even um, I've done, I did a conference in Malaysia this year where I thought, how could I demonstrate how good branding could be better than other branding people and the conference organizers? So I actually took some video footage, left the conference, and within like, I think one, one and a half hours later, I had a 30 second trailer video of what I did at the conference and then uploaded it. And people are like, wow, you, are you like a genie or something? Like, how did you manage to do that? It's really simple. With free software, you can film stuff. Um, how many of you use clips if you've got an iPhone? Okay, do you like it? Yeah. Without kind of, <laughs> you have to remember not to look at the words. So for you that don't know what clips is, there are free apps on your phone that maybe you haven't even explored where you can look into your phone and film and it will recognize your voice and will auto headline. So for those people that look at your videos in the toilet that don't have the sound on, they can read what it is that you're saying. And you don't have to type in uh, the subtitles. They're, they're automatically generated. There are uh, other pieces of software where I, I used one where you can just collect 15 second clips and then just click generate. And it will automatically stitch them all together, fade them in, fade them out, pick the soundtrack that it thinks is important. And it's like, there's a video. And like, wow. Do you want to reshuffle? No, I like that one. Um, so some of the things that I've done, I actually start, I, I actually just did it with my family, right? So if I need to get good at video, it's like, let me film my kids. Let me do the, the headlines and subtitles thing with my children. Let me read a bedtime story. Let me like film a birthday party. I made my one of my daughter's birthday parties look so amazing. When actually, you know, when you've got family at parties, then you know there's always a bit of politics, right? But when you <coughs> cut out all of the things like people arriving one and a half hours late and everyone is smiling, it looks like the most amazing birthday party. That's what I learned from journalism: the fact that they can take one minute and fill it full of information. So it's not a new thing. I reckon if Newton was around, he'd be a vlogger. Why do I say this? Because colleagues in the U.S. Uh, looked at his uh, manuscripts and they found that actually he carried advertising in his um, research manuals. If you'd like to do this experiment, you can go to this shop and you can buy this equipment, and this is how you do it, right? So he actually was very good at marketing and disseminating his research and using advertising, which is a paid for piece of communication. He's obviously got like, if I'm gonna put your like shop in my in my uh, experiment manual, then you know you need to give me X, Y, Z, and I'll give you some more equipment. So don't be afraid to try new innovative things because some of the great thinkers have always done that. If you're going to do these things, learn the rules. Learn what you can break, what you can stretch, and go out and do some cool stuff. 
I remember uh, researching and looking at, at uh, advice from sports coaches, and some sports coaches say that if you want to win, basically, they say either you've got to do things with such intensity and ferocity and such power that people can't survive on the park with you, right? Don't you laugh? Because that was in Scotland. Yeah, the, yeah, it was. Uh, it, that was a rugby coach, of course, right? I think that's what Scotland tried to do. They did it with Argentina, didn't they? Uh, or you've got to have explicit knowledge of the rules and stretch people um, and be able to deliver and execute in ways that they can't. So if we apply that into a, a business sense, if you're going to go online, think about how you can make a splash. Now, that doesn't mean doing necessarily stupid things, but how could you deliver impacts? Like, and, and for me, that was thinking, actually, a couple of years ago, when I looked, academics weren't engaged in LinkedIn. So I thought, okay, this is kind of easy. I could just go on LinkedIn. When I looked at what people were talking about, there's a lot of stuff where there are a lot of grey suits and people kind of say, here's me at a conference, grey suit. And after you scroll through like about 10 grey suits, you're like, okay, I'm not interested anymore. So I'll pull an ugly face. Here's me at a conference. Like, what conference was that? And I actually did research an ugly, ugly face selfies were better than, than kind of standard selfies, in the UK especially. Right? You've got to paint from that. So I started thinking that looking at the environment, if you disrupt behavior, right, and for me that was tackling issues to do with race, religion, and politics, because I was always told not to talk about race, religion, and politics, especially not in business, then it was open water, right? What about if I tackle these things? And that's why, you know, you'd seen that I, I was in Russia last month, I've been to Iran, Saudi Arabia, and I'm still alive, you know, I'm, I'm able to go to these countries, crack a few jokes, and, um, and come back again, and I'm still able to, to share the information. So think about where you can know those rules, stretch them, break them. And essentially that means, I call this, well, I'm in Scotland, I'll call it the Scott approach. How convenient, right? Um, but really, I think it can be broken down into this. You have to be able to demonstrate something, and I call that show your game, right? Then you have a competitive edge. You have to be able to claim your name. You have to own your name. How many of you, for example, own your own uh, domain name, as in your name? Not enough, right? Not enough. So like, for example, if you contact me, you can go to drjohnwilson.com, I bought that domain name. Like how many of you, if we don't have a job for life, have considered that the thing that you do hold on to is your name? So if people wanted to contact you, having your own name as a website makes sense. The first thing, the second thing I did after naming my, my kids was to buy a domain name in their name because they might not be able to buy their own name in a few years time. I'm not using it, but I think that it's really important. Invest in yourself because, you know, if you want to back yourself as being successful, then why shouldn't you buy your own domain name, which costs about two, five pounds a year, something like that. So own your name, not just kind of in terms of within your community, but physically own as many of the assets that you have at your disposal as possible. And try and trade on those things and show that you're a connected thought leader. Um, so I guess one of the other things I should say that's inspiring is, when I learnt, who are, the, who are the academics in the room? Hands up. Okay. So what's the most that you've heard a professor be paid for, for a, a day's worth of conference talking type stuff? Two. Two what? Grand. Try 200,000. So, so the day that I, I spoke at a conference with somebody and I thought, great, they're flying me over, they're giving me chicken and rice, and they flew this guy over in a different class, and I get chicken and rice, and he gets chicken and rice plus 200,000 for a day. It was the day I thought, I need to kind of like think about improving my branding, right? Even a little bit of that would, would, be, would be quite tasty. 200,000. Obviously, it's taken him a few years. And it wasn't, it was like, you might say, oh, that's just a one off. And then I went around to these different conferences, and they're like, you paid him too as well? Wow. So, this can happen if you kind of apply some of the brand theory. A lot of us would be happy with 2,000 pounds, right? Um, but think about these things, about how you can get yourself further up the queue. So, LinkedIn have a campaign. They have a new campaign that came out last week called Hashtag In It Together. Um, I got uh, an award from LinkedIn, as, as you heard from Claire in December. And when I asked them, like, why did you give me an award? It was pretty much that I was consistent. I tackled real issues and personality. Um, and it wasn't that I had the most followers or the most likes, but there was diversity 
in the different audiences of people that would comment. So they could see that there were CEOs, there were academics, there were students, people from different countries that would find interesting ways to debate with them. So I want to kind of encourage you to think about how you can engage in these platforms. And actually, it's really easy, because if you go on LinkedIn and you have your profile, and you can upload a video, we can do them today. Um, it's quite fun, and it's definitely benefited. I mean, LinkedIn, I think, of all of the platforms that you could, you could exist on, for us, it makes the most sense, because I do get invitations through LinkedIn. I do get job offers. I do get quite a lot of stuff. And even more uh, rewarding is the fact that now that I'm encouraging my students to, to spend more time on LinkedIn, uh, I've moved away from Moodle to, to some extent because news is being uh, uploaded from all over the world on LinkedIn. So if I can get my students to exist on LinkedIn and to interact with that news and those professionals, and then you know, and they care about me now, but but maybe they won't care about me in, a, in two years' time because they'll graduate and think, oh, he's just an academic. He isn't about the real world. But I invest in them early uh, because if I try and connect with them in a couple of years' time, they may not want to connect. But whilst we're face to face, going back to the first slide, we do that straight away. And I try and channel things through LinkedIn. So if you can do that, I think that it's quite fun. The best example I've got is uh, an in class presentation. So, so encouraging students, rather than doing the in class presentation, uh, to actually do videos. And I said that they could do videos wherever they want. So some of them actually said, can we do our coursework in the holidays? If you want, first time ever, right? But like, here's me doing my presentation on this brand on a beach or in the snow. And I've uploaded some of them on YouTube. And they did those. And then they had uh, some currency that when uh, one student said, I said, what's your dream job? And she said, working for an ad agency in Dubai. So, well, let's go through LinkedIn. I know somebody in an ad agency in Dubai. Let's message them and send them a video link to a video. And she got the job or she got a job. They should come over then. Because I think the other thing about video is, we, as we mentioned, uh, as we discussed with Amazon, people are shopping right, in their own time, online, at their own leisure. So if you can give them content that they can snap on, that's really important. So LinkedIn, just to show you, I know that you're getting up. Because, sorry, this is the last slide. <laughs> <laughs> if you found my profile, you haven't found it already, then that's a kind of another, another way of looking at it. I've purposely made my profile a little bit different because I think maybe it's my, it's my own hangups, but professors are generally perceived as being a bit boring and out of touch. Right? So my idea was I wanted to communicate within split seconds that I'm a free spirit, smart, busy, connected, original, talented, breadth and depth. You have a headline there. You have your name, headline, what it is that you do, and a couple of pictures. So I tried to maximize their effectiveness, even down to kind of you know, co-opting the color pink. Um, I did quite a lot of research on the colour pink and I, I kind of found that like, you know, there aren't many guys wearing pink online on LinkedIn, so if I just wear pink trainers and, like, and pink stuff, then, then you stand out a little bit more. So I've really thought about these things in a very nerdy way. So with that, I'd say yeah, thanks for, for listening, but just do it. And throughout today, if there are any questions, I think we're speaking later on on, on a panel, then I would encourage you to do that. Before we finish, though, I've got to collect some background footage, right? There's going to be no audio, but at least, because then this can go into another video. I'm going to like video. If you want to pull ugly faces or wave or anything like that, then you're, you're up. <laughs> Everyone, no ugly faces. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Sorry.